So what I really wanted to talk to you about today is a question that, frankly, keeps me up at night. <laughs> and uh, actually gets me out of bed in the morning. And that question is, why do we sleep? Uh, you know, we spend roughly a third of our lives asleep. Uh, hopefully for, the most of us, for most of us, that means decades of our life in this kind of immobile and unresponsive state. You know, when we're asleep, we cannot eat, we cannot mate, we cannot protect ourselves from predators, we can't care for our young. You know, if you, if you deprive a rat of sleep, that rat will die in about the same amount of time as it will die without food. And of course, we all know that tens of millions of Americans suffer from inadequate sleep and all the health consequences that ensue from that. And despite all of this, we still don't know why we sleep. So the question is, how are we going to answer this question, this really important and fundamental question? And you know, I'm kind of a simple person. And one way I would approach this problem is to simply ask the question, well, what are the bad things that happen when you don't sleep? Maybe that'll tell us why it is we need to sleep. So this is an experiment. Oops. This is an experiment here that was done by Kathy Reed and Dawson, in which what they did is they had people perform a simple hand-eye coordination task. But they did it with increasing amounts of time being awake. And what they found is that as, you're, as you are awake for longer and longer and longer, your performance declines over time. Okay? But they did, and that sort of makes sense. But then they did an interesting secondary experiment. And that is, they had these people drink some beer, or two, or three or more. <laughs> and they did the same experiment on this hand-eye coordination task. But this time, they measured their blood alcohol concentration. And not surprisingly, as your blood alcohol concentration goes up, your performance on this task goes down. But then they did something even more interesting. And that is, they plotted the data of wakefulness versus performance, but now, they, perform, they added in the blood alcohol concentration equivalent of that level of performance. And so what they showed here is that if you've been awake for 19 hours, and this is on average, your blood alcohol, your performance is equivalent to someone with a blood alcohol concentration of 0.07. Okay? 19 hours, that means you're a person who gets five hours of sleep a night. Right? And if you go up to 23 hours, you're now blood alcohol concentration equivalent of 0.09. So this is 0.08 is driving under the influence in the state of Illinois. So if you don't get enough sleep, you're basically drunk. So a second way of thinking about what sleep might be doing is in comparing the human brain to a supercomputer, OK? And this is, we're, we're going to use the Fujitsu K computer, uh, which was the fastest supercomputer a long time ago, which means 2011. And <laughs> the supercomputer, the, the ones now are even faster. But that supercomputer was pretty good. It's four times faster than the human brain. It is, has 10 times more storage than the human brain. Amazing machine. To accomplish this amazing power, the this supercomputer uses 10 million watts of power, right? The human brain, and this, by the way, is enough to power several thousand homes. The human brain, on the other hand, uses only 20 watts of power, <laughs> almost one one millionth the amount of power to, to, to power the human brain. And of course, 20 watts is, amount, is the amount you would need to power a dim light bulb. So if someone refers to you as dim, you should take that as a compliment. <laughs> so one hypothesis is 
the way that the brain has been able to accomplish this amazing efficiency coupled to the computational power of the brain is through sleep, that sleep helps us achieve this remarkable ability. Sleep also improves memory in really some amazing ways. So this is an experiment done by Matthew Walker and Bob Stickgold, where they had people perform a simple motor task, basically type, uh, you know, pressing these uh, buttons here in a certain order. And so what they did is they trained people at 10 o'clock in the morning, okay? And so in the first trial of going through these digits, they could do, you could go through 14 of these sequences in a given trial, and after 12 trials, you could get up to about 22, again, on average. And then what they did, so that you learned, you got better as you, as you did this. It's a learning task. Then what they did is they tested them again at 10 p.m. Of course, they've been awake all day. And then they allowed them a night of sleep and tested them at 10 a.m. the following day. Now, intuitively to me, and maybe to all the students here, if I had you learn something in the morning and I said, well, when do you want the exam? I can give it to you tonight or tomorrow. And you can't study. That's the key. I think most people would say, well, I don't want to forget it, so I'll give it to me as soon as possible. But it turns out, oops, excuse me. It, it turns out that if you test, wow, I'm having trouble here. It turns out that if you test them at 10 p.m., they do about the same as 10 a.m. And if you test them after a night of sleep, magically almost, they show this dramatic improvement. So you dramatically improved your ability to carry out some task simply after being laying in bed for hopefully for about eight hours. It's really kind of a, what is sleep doing? We don't know, but it seems to be improving our memory as well. Now, the last function I want to talk about is what I call the brainwashing function, okay? And it's been called this, the brainwashing function. And that is, we know that neurodegenerative diseases, and we'll hear a little about later, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, traumatic brain injury are frequently associated with disrupted sleep. And the, I would say what people mostly think is that what happens is, is the accumulation of neurotoxic proteins leads to neuronal cell death, and that's what leads to the disrupted sleep. But this view has been changing slowly and recently. And what we're learning is that sleep plays a critical role in clearing out these toxins from our brains. And as a result, the disrupted sleep you might be observing in, in concert with a disease like Alzheimer's may actually facilitate the accumulation of these neurotoxic proteins and lead to the very disease that we're seeing. So I think what I've shown you is a number of different things that happen, bad things that happen when you don't sleep. Is this telling us the function of sleep? I don't think so, and the reason is what we still don't know, all these amazing things that sleep does, we do not know how sleep does it. And until we can answer that question, I don't think we can answer the why. And I'll explain why I think that. Okay, so well, I should have mentioned here also that sleep is also associated with other psychiatric diseases like depression. So what I wanna move on to is thinking about how do we think about sleep? How can we answer this question? And one way to think about sleep is sleep is controlled by two processes. We have a homeostatic process called process S. And what does that mean, homeostatic process? What that means is that the longer you're awake, the stronger the drive is to sleep. So if you pull an all-nighter, you're gonna feel really tired and try to catch up on your sleep. You've been awake for several hours now, so you're probably all experiencing a very strong drive to sleep at this very moment. Now, but what this homeostatic process means is that there's a certain amount of sleep you need to get, a set point. Think of it as a set point. If you don't get that, your body tries to get it. You have a drive to get it. And this homeostatic process is, is critical to answering the question of why we need to sleep. If we need to get a certain amount, wh why is that? We don't know. There's a second process called process C, and this is a circadian process. And so, what process C, a circadian process, does is time sleep. It basically serves as an internal alarm clock that wakes you up during the day. And so right now, in the face of this 
overwhelming drive to fall asleep, your internal alarm clock, it says it's daytime, stay awake. Please stay awake. Um, and so we think by studying these processes, particularly the homeostatic process, we can understand why it is we sleep. Now, a way to think about homeostasis is to think about it as a feedback loop. So you have various signals that keep you awake. You've got uh, the alarm clock I told you about already. We've got the sun. When the light comes out, we wake up. And various signals like hunger that keep you awake, which you no longer have at this moment. And if you, if you, uh, if you uh, stay awake for a long time, you see the buildup of various factors, like factor S, and this is a mythical factor, I'm just calling it that. And if you're awake for long enough, this builds up and is sensed by some sensor that says, okay, there's enough factor S around, I've been awake for a while, and that's gonna trigger then sleep. And sleep will then return factor S back to its set point level, okay? And if you uh, stay awake for a long time, perhaps you pull an all-nighter, perhaps your sleep is not of very good quality, then all the factor S gets to excessive levels. And all those bad things that I talked about, whether it's reduced motor function, efficiency, memory, diseases like Alzheimer's and depression, those bad things can then happen. So how can we discern the function of this homeostatic process or homeostat? Well, it's useful to think about another kind of homeostatic system that I think we're all familiar with, and that's the thermostat in our house, for example, okay? Now, I told you before, if you wanna understand the function of sleep, you say, well, you get rid of it, what are the bad things that happen? Well, let's, what if we did that for the thermostat? What if we broke the thermostat in our house, said, okay, well, what happens? That'll tell me what the thermostat does. Well, if you broke that thermostat on the day of one of the recent uh, polar vortex days we had here, what would happen is your pipes would freeze, they would burst, you'd have water flooding all over the place. And you would have concluded from that experiment, if you will, that the function of the thermostat has to do with plumbing, right? It's all about the plumbing. Now, I think we all realize that that line of thinking, which is really the, the kind of thinking we've been using to understand sleep, is probably misleading and it's why we still don't understand why it is that we sleep. If you really want to understand what the thermostat does, what you really need to know is what does the thermostat sense? What is it measuring? And ultimately, what is it controlling? And we know the answer to that question is temperature. We don't know what the answer to that question is for sleep. So how are we gonna figure out then what does this how does this homeostat work? What is it precisely being sensed and what is precisely being controlled? And our strategy is to take this engine, for example, and how would you study an engine? Well, one way, one strategy you could use for studying the engine is to remove one piece at a time and ask what happens to the engine? Very simple. I'm a very simple person, I've already said. Okay. Now. We, we're, we're obviously not studying engines, we're studying animals. And so what we're doing is instead of taking a piece out of an engine, we're taking a gene out of the organism and asking, is that gene important for sleep? And the organism that's very well suited to this genetic approach is that fruit fly that we've, many of us have used in our high school biology classes. And the fruit fly is an a phenomenal system, actually, for studying human biology and disease. So flies have been used as models for learning and memory, for aging, for Alzheimer's disease, even for a disease like autism. But the beauty of the fly is really the economies of scale. That is, one can screen the function of thousands of genes very cheaply and very rapidly. So the way we measure sleep in the flies, we basically put them into a glass tube. The fly walks back and forth here, breaks this infrared beam. Each beam break is counted as a unit of activity. So we're basically measuring the activity of the fly. There we go. And here's what the data look like. 
what you can see is that the fly has bouts of activity about every 24 hours. And this reflects the timing of its sleep-wake cycle. And you also see that the fly has these per long periods of inactivity that can last for hours. And they really do have all of the attributes of sleep. Let me prove that to you. So here's a fly right here, life size. And the fly exhibits all of what I would call the cardinal features of sleep. So you have immobility, does it stops moving. It's not sleeping yet, by the way. Um, it has an elevated arousal threshold. That means once it stops moving, you have to poke it harder to get it to move. It's unresponsive. It has, if you sleep deprive the fly, it tries to catch up the next day to sleep more. And if you sleep deprive the fly, you will block its ability to incorporate memories, just like the experiment I showed you earlier. And the fly also has its, its sleep is under the control of a clock, just like ours is, and there are electrical correlates. And finally, the fly passes what's called the Starbucks test. That is, if you give the fly caffeine, you will keep the fly awake. So I hope I've convinced you that, yes, fruit flies do sleep. So over the, about 40 years ago, Seymour Benzer at Caltech started to do genetic screens of the variety I've told you, looking for things that affected that circadian component of sleep. Okay, and so shown here is, is an example of some of the data. So here's a wild type fly, a normal fly. It has actually has two bouts of wakefulness in a normal day. It wakes up at 8 a.m., sleeps in the middle of the day, and then wakes up again at 6 p.m. He had identified a mutant called the period short mutant, or per short, in which this mutant wakes up early at about 6 a.m. and about 1 p.m. So there's a mutant that's affecting the timing at which the fly is sleeping and waking. Okay? It's that timing feature, not the homeostatic feature. Now it turns out, fast forward 25 years later, and, we, and they've discovered a family of individuals with a similar phenotype. So we normally wake up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and these individuals with a syndrome called familial advanced sleep phase syndrome, or FASPS, they wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, stably wake up. They actually inherit this from one of their parents. So this phenotype is very similar to the phenotype I showed you for these fruit flies. And it turns out that this advanced phase of their sleep-wake cycle is due to a mutation in the human version of that Drosophila period gene. Truly remarkable. So what this tells us is that how sleep-wake behavior is controlled between a fruit fly and a human being is actually conserved. They use similar genes. And that watching these flies walk back and forth in these little glass tubes will tell us something about our own sleep-wake behavior and perhaps even tell us why it is we sleep. So we've done a few experiments that I'd just like to go through quickly in the last couple of minutes here. Um, first question we had is where in the brain is sleep regulated in the fly? And so we've looked at, um, uh, we expressed a protein called Shibiri TS. It's a temperature sensitive protein. And what, ha what the Shibiri TS does when you express it in a neuron is that at a cool temperature or permissive temperature, it allows that neuron to communicate to other neurons, okay? But if you raise the temperature to a high temperature, a restrictive temperature, it blocks that communication between neurons that's essential for brain function. And so basically, by using temperature, controlling the temperature of the environment, we can essentially have a remote control for that brain function in a live fly. And now we can ask, what does that neuron do for sleep? So shown here is just we cycle between the cold and the warm temperature. This is what the sleep profile looks like. And then we looked at flies in which when you block that communication, that's what happens at the high temperature, you block sleep. And when we look to see what part of the brain did this, and the mushroom bodies are essentially an analog of our cerebral cortex. And it turns out this is a part of the brain that the fly uses for its own learning and memory. So here we found a part of the brain that links learning and memory to sleep. Now we've also been doing um, genetic uh, screens large-scale ones, I told you economies of scale, we've screened over a 1,000 mutant strains. What does that mean? That means in each single strain of flies, 
one gene has been disrupted. And then we can look through a thousand different strains, each with a thousand different genes that have been disrupted, look at their sleep-wake behavior, and then ask what happens to sleep. So we identified, here's what the histogram looks like. So most flies sleep about 1,000 minutes a day, which is about 16 hours, okay? It's a long time for a fruit fly. And we identified this one mutant that we called insomniac, or INC for short. And insomniac only sleeps about six hours a day. And what's even more interesting about insomniac is that if you actually sleep deprive this insomniac fly, which doesn't sleep that much to begin with, it doesn't show, it doesn't have an increased drive to sleep afterwards. So what we think is going on is that if you think about that feedback loop, what we think insomniac is doing is coupling wake to the production of factor S. That is, if you can't produce factor S, then you won't need to sleep, because factor S is what's driving sleep. That's shown here. So what we'd like to understand is how, how is insomniac linked to the production of factor S? We'd like to understand what are the other genes that constitute this homeostatic feedback loop? What are the genes important for the production of factor S that encode for factor S? that are important for sensing factor S and for, and for controlling the levels of factor S. And we think if we understand that, then we'll be able to develop treatments that allow us to mitigate the adverse effects of sleep loss. And once we do that, I would argue, then we truly can say we know the answer to the question, why do we sleep? Thank you very much.